we're going to we're going to open it up. So we're just going to move into just a broader question period. So we have both of our speakers mm -hmm. here. Um, so you can ask um, either of them questions about their work, and also you can ask you know questions that cross cut across the two Let's of them uh, across the, their two yeah. talks. Let me just doctor. throw out there a couple of questions can, that can, they came with. Maybe John could answer that that question. Yeah. That was just he's he's a neurologist. <laughs> Let me just throw out a couple of questions that the speakers themselves, you know, proposed for general discussion, but there's no reason to stick to these, but let me just put them out there so you can ponder them as you raise whatever questions you have. So it's open to all questions, but let me just put out these couple of questions that they proposed. Um, so uh, John suggested that we might want to think about in this context, what does understanding mean? Okay, think about that a little bit. And uh, David? I um, uh, uh, thought it would be interesting to think about how can neural data adjudicate between alternative theories of behavior slash cognition? Um, so, again, just against that backdrop, if you have something related to these questions, it's great. Any other question you might have, now's the time. Oh. Are you moderating? I guess so, yeah. So, Patricia. Yep. Oh, the mic. I, I, I can speak very loudly. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's. I think for the recording, maybe it might be. Thank you. Thank you for those really stimulating talks. I'm Patricia Janik. I, I really enjoyed them. And I think, um, uh, in general, people, what you say will resonate with very, very many people, including neuroscientists, at least some of them, and psychologists. Uh, but I had a question that I, I want to direct uh, first to, um, well, maybe to both of you. So within the first talk, we heard the question why, and when you were talking about a very reductionist experiment and that learning about oxytocin and social reward, you're still left with why. Does that play a role? Is it not? There we go. Hello? There. Now it is. Okay. Sure. Sure. So John asked in the beginning uh, the very critical question why. Um, why does oxytocin, for example, impact reward? And so what I'm interested in knowing from you e both is what is a satisfactory answer to the question why for you? So uh, John, we, for example, heard about your uh, really cool experiments looking at explicit and implicit memory mechanisms uh, in motor learning. And at the end of that, I was wondering, did we get or did you get the answer to why from those series of experiments? What is your why, and what is the answer to your why? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Oh, it's, it is on. Right, right. Um, so, so, yeah. I actually want to move this a little more. Yes. You're not like in a corner. I mean, I don't want you to feel that you're in a, you're in a corner. <laughs> I'll go in the corner. Okay. Um, <laughs> right. So that that is, so if you, if you um, look at how do we explain things, like you go to physics, you know, this billiard ball pushes against that billiard ball, and it makes that billiard ball move, right? It's all about sort of action verbs and consequences, right? It, um, and if you look at Descartes' bizarre drawings where he would go down a level and just show things jostling that were causing the big thing, right? So it's actually a very deep question about what does it mean when some object through an activity impinges on another object? And you go, oh, I know why that billiard ball went, because another billiard ball hit it. Right? And then you go to neuroscience, and you talk about David Robinson's explanation of a saccade, right? where he says you need to have a burst phase and a hold phase. Raza Shadmi has written a beautiful set of reviews about this recently. Right? And then you go, well, computationally, you're going to have to sort of integrate the velocity signal to get a position signal. And then you go, well, what neurons are going to have to be able to have that kind of computation? And then you get the whole thing, as I said in my talk. And you go, ah, I understand how a saccade is formed. Right? Um, that feels a little bit like billiard balls hitting other billiard balls. Right? Saying that oxytocin is involved in reward isn't remotely close to that type of explanation, right? So if you want that kind of billiard ball, this hits that kind of explanation, I think it's really difficult. 
as I said to Jim, once you start getting up to more complex behavior. But then you get what David was talking about, where you say, well, you know, I know that there's, that there's this grammatical structure in the world, and there's a problem. You need to put, as you said, the white spaces in all the right places, all the way up the level of abstraction, from syllables to full sentences. And then you begin to get the brain work, in my view, sort of beginning to confirm that that is the way the problem is seen by the brain, and it seems to be decomposing the problem in the way that one posited it would have to. Right? Now, that you're right that that is not... Well, how does it take that abstract knowledge and impose it upon its oscillations so that it passes? Right? That implementational level, I, I don't think David claimed that he knows how that abstract information is used. Right? But nevertheless, at some level of higher granularity, beyond the implementational level, you can still nod, and we all nodded when he said it, because we were getting it. Right? But my worry is that when we say oxytocin calls reward, at no level are we getting anything other than making a causal claim. Right? So it's not understanding sentences at the higher level, like David gave. It's not understanding at the lower level that David Robinson gave. It's just a causal statement. That's, that's my concern. Um, hi, I'm Robinson. I'm a librarian here, and so I'm kind of an outsider, although I, I do work with both Brenda and Barbara when their literature needs. So um, all the recent talk about reproducibility, especially in psychology, and the um, uh, problems you both pointed out this morning with working at different levels and trying to talk across these gaps and what really happened with HM and, and all of this stuff, now I'm curious about how, how can we better improve the graduate level of education in neuroscience and linguistics so that some of the, the filter words and, and those kinds of assumptions, causality, is all a little more clear to everybody. My turn. <laughs> I mean, it's a good question. Why uh, the, I, I guess, come out here. I, I, I want to hide. Is it, is it, is it, I have a mic. He's wearing a mic. I'm wearing a microphone still. I mean, I guess I, I would hope, or I encourage certainly my graduate students to not, so one of the things we do in graduate school is we throw them into these, you know, technical, extravaganzas that we use. And people have to become very proficient in all kinds of difficult to master techniques. And what we forget, and I think both of us sort of emphasize that, is kind of concept the hard conceptual work that goes into this, into the experiments, regardless of whatever level they at, into what is what even is an explanation. I don't know, you know, do you when have you been to a lab meeting in any lab where unless it's a lab that happens to work on the concept of explanation? You say, what does it mean for us to understand something, to explain something? What, what is the notion of a mechanism, and so on? So even re so, a little bit more reflection would be good for graduate students, and maybe a course, quite frankly, in the history of science. So a semester of history of science hasn't hurt anyone, um, and it's and it a lot, it sort of forces you to face down some of these things. It's very yeah. useful. Philosophy of science, history of science. Yeah, I, I would add. I, I mean, I, you know, I, I, my brother and I just did a current biology interview on, on this topic, and. Um, and you said you were in the, in the humanities? I'm in the library. Well, okay, great. Okay. Um, it turns out that books and essays, in my view, are, uh, I mean, people have written about them, more complex objects than scientific papers and talks, right? Um, and in science, we don't write books or write essays anymore, right? We write these salami slices of incomprehensible figures and things, right? What I think has to happen, I absolutely agree with David, people should be taught the history, the philosophy, the sociology of science. Okay. Any scientist who says they don't need to do philosophy should be immediately banished from the university. Okay. <laughs> because they're doing philosophy all the time, they're just doing it weekly. Right? 
right? Because they're constantly making normative judgments. Whenever a scientist says, this is an excellent, interesting paper, they're making normative judgments. There's no excellent variable anywhere plotted in the paper. So if you immediately say to a scientist, why is this an important paper, they're doing philosophy. Okay. Um, the other thing I would say um, is, don't just do something, stand there. I think if, I don't know how many, if, if, a, if a grad student or a postdoc were to say to their PI, I think this week I'm going to go to the library and read. Good luck. <laughs> right? Good luck. When you, in fact, that's exactly what they should be encouraged to do. So unfortunately, what's happened is that there's very little discussion. There's an absolute worship of methodology and statistical significance. If Darwin were to apply for a job today, and, and they said, what do you want to do, Mr. Darwin? I think, well, I'd like to go on a boat ride for a couple of years, <laughs> read Humboldt, and walk through forests with a notebook. You, thank you very much. Do you do up to genetics? <laughs> right? What's happened is that academic science has become profoundly anti-intellectual. And libraries, I think, are the answer, because people need to read books again. Very, 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 very few scientists read books. Your book, maybe. So. <laughs> <laughs> Just to pick one at random. <laughs> Hi. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, um, uh, my name is Sai Prakash, and I'm a former lecturer in the chemical engineering department. Um, I have a question regarding uh, speech production. Um, I'm not sure if you're willing to answer. Um, Let's that, see. <laughs> so, I mean, I might so, say no. Um, uh, but uh, that can come in second. I mean, the first question I want to ask is, like, what is the impact of fear on learning? Um, this I ask uh, uh, this I ask specifically because because although I spent some time teaching here, I grew up in India, and there was a different teaching style and things like that. Um, and 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 um, during a particular transition between between one school to another, I noticed there were completely different teaching styles, um, uh, and and that had a significant impact not only on. Uh, uh, my development with regard to certain aspects, some positive, not, some not so. Um, but I just wanted to know what it does. Um, actually, I mean, like, like to, to give you a broader uh, picture, um, it went from a co-education school with female teachers to a strict all-boys school with very strict <laughs> male teachers. And I was wondering what the impact of fear is uh, on learning. I know that uh, you know people use the idea that uh, some amount of anxiety uh, in students is good for motivation because you don't want them to be too relaxed or too lax or not anything, but, but, but too much of it is detrimental. I suspect there's somebody here in the audience who's better suited than us, right? It's, I mean, there's certainly an interesting, extremely tight relationship between you know, fear circuitry and learning. But I'm a bit, who volunteers to answer this question who actually works on this topic here? Because it's not John and it's not me. Because it's a good, it's a, it's a very good question, which is studied by people like Joe yeah, Ledoux a, and Liz would, Phelps and people like that. I would, no, I agree that there's. I, I would just say I mean, one thing about the, the, you know, the teaching styles about fear. I mean, fear. I agree with David. I don't do fear, right? Um, but I, I would say fear. that that word is used to diminish actual debate in scientific forums. If you go nowadays, people go, well, you get, what a great talk, right? That's the first thing people say, right? Great talk, and then it's sort of like, what is it, the Oreo cookie thing? You have to see something nice, and you see something critical, and something nice, right? Um, and what's happened, I think, is because of this notion of fear that you can't have debates anymore, right? Because any disagreement somehow now becomes internalized as an attack or a hominem. Right? So that's, so fear itself is, yeah, and in motor learning there's work on punishment versus reward for learning rates, for example. But I think what my guess is, when you're talking about teaching styles, I mean, 
fear is unacceptable, right? Making someone frightened, I can't imagine how that could possibly be justified, right? But debate, I think, has been turned into this notion of it being criticism and attack. And, so, and that, and I think, is very bad. I have a 30-second answer okay. to go into, just for fun, just as a shameless advertisement for my own research. This highly recommended paper uh, about the fear circuitry as it gets turned on by listening to screams. And how are, how are screams organized uh, you know, acoustically? What do they lead to behaviorally? And what do they do when you, uh, in terms of its activation pattern? It's a paper in Current Biology by Martin uh -huh. Ebb. It's all about how when you listen to screams, the, the scarier you rate them, the more the fear circuitry is actually activated. So that's production and fear together. So I answered <laughs> two of your questions. And did advertisement. <laughs> so, okay, score. There's a couple more questions. So, um, let's see. Okay, so a Amy Shelton, Johns Hopkins. Um, so, coming from cognitive neuroscience and psychology and education, so um, short answer to the fear thing is there's not a lot of work on that. There's a lot of work on aggressive environments. Um, and also I'll be speaking later today about um, making some of these connections from the level of explanation into the education world. Um, so we'll have a chance to hopefully talk about more of those things. And in thinking about what you, um, both of you talked about, where you really laid out frameworks uh, for thinking about crossing these levels of explanation. And one question I had was, um, how to think about the issues of development in these contexts, because really there's a huge disconnect between what we call developmental neuroscience and what we call sort of developmental psychology, developmental science at that cognitive level. So I was really curious in how you might think about those developmental issues uh, in this space as well. You know, it, 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 it's really interesting that, you know, people always say uh, um, that uh, when kids learn better than adults in motor skills, right? I mean, that's, um, and, and yet when you look at the literature to find evidence that that's actually true, you can't really, you can't find it. In fact, on the tasks that are used, the adults always do better than the kids. And then you're left with a paradox again. is, well, why do we all believe that there's a difference, that you need to learn when you're young? And, right? and I don't know the, know the answer yet, although I have some ideas about why that is. Um, and, I, and I think that that kind of work um, would be really useful to, in fact, test our hypotheses that we use in adults or, or, or young adults. Um, and I agree with you also that, you know, having spent a lot of time around developmental neuroscientists, that it has absolutely nothing to do. I mean, the gap, I don't think, could be wider uh, than... Mm -hmm. um, with one incredible little paper, if I may advertise, but the paper done in science last year where they took mice that don't have a monosynaptic connection to their pores. In other words, mice don't have those monosynaptic connections, and they developmentally interfered with that monosynaptic connection in the postdoc in the lab. Showed. And then these mice were unbelievably dexterous. They were holding spaghetti going, mm, like this. And, and, and it made you wonder, why didn't, why didn't they get selected for these super dexterous mice and lose those connections? So I think that was the one example where a developmental study was actually very profoundly interesting. I, yeah. Hi. Marianne Wilson, Kennedy Krieger Institute. Um, I guess this is really a question related to, to the prior question. It's for David. Have you looked at um, developing, you know, over language development in children, say when they're at the single word phase, when they're building a vocabulary, would you expect to see the syllabic response and maybe the phrase response developing there, and then later see development of that one hertz sentence response? Absolutely, very good question uh, is being done by people. That? And yes, you would expect from, in fact, we can show from the get-go, even neonates, that you track um, energy fluctuations in materials very faithfully. So that's there from the get-go. But you would expect uh, over development that, yeah, the peaks that are reflective filler word of um, building structure of structure building operations or things like constituency would come in later and in fact I 
you can do it in, an, in, in, a, in the adult version. You can teach people artificial grammars. I just finished an experiment like that with um, Lisa Newport. And you can see at the beginning, when you don't know the structure of the thing, you just follow the stimulus. And as you actually learn the structure, these peaks appear. And relatively quickly, by the way, you don't need a lot of exposure. You, you stipulate structure very early on in the learning process. So it's a very good idea, and it would be, very, it would be a very interesting non-invasive way to track when uh, developing, when a, when a kid actually begins to have access to that, or when those kind of operations uh, manifest themselves. So it's a good experiment. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Lisa. I'm a physics student here, so I'm kind of closer to old engineers you've been talking about. I have a question for John. So what you say about the granularity of, you know, when you try to study a psychological problem, that speaks to me on a very deep level, because it's the same in physics. You don't always want to go to quantum mechanics to study a problem of a brick falling from the sky. But whenever you separate a system into its constituent parts, for each part, you could then also separate it and study that from its constituent parts. So in your field, do you think, well, essentially, if you do that, you will reach the neuron level. Do you think that would teach you anything new, or should you just stay on this granular level that you begin with? Because splitting it further won't actually produce any new results. Well, right, that is the million dollar question, right? In other words, no, it is. In other words, if you look at people who study complexity, there's no a priori way of knowing what the level of granularity should be. Right? There's, there's no formula. Right? Um, and then that's wedded with the question you asked, which is, is there some foundational level that is obvious? In other words, is the neuron the obvious place, or now the, the new worshipped thing, the circuit? Right? Um, there's no obvious way to know that's the right turtle. Right? Neuroscientists think it's the right turtle, right? but they, it's not clear that it is. Right? Um, and then, as we argue in the paper, I think... The reason why multi-level is good is that if you do have your favorite level of granularity, maybe that will just turn out to be taste. Right? It does, that level you like will be enriched by going above it and below it. I, I really believe that. So even if you say that's your level of explanation, it will be enriched. And then the final point, which I think is the one that we should all solve, and it's the one you know, at the Santa Fe Institute, for example, they worry about all the time, is we don't have bridging theories. Right? I mean, the linking theory that David talked about. We, it, we can say it, we can intuit the need for it, we can articulate it every way we want, but an actual theory that does it is extremely difficult. Right? It, 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 it doesn't exist in biology as far as I know. Hey, I'm Asan from Reza Shadmir Lab, PhD student here at Johns Hopkins. So my question is mainly for John, um, and I want to ask for your opinion uh, for this question. So uh, in David's talk, there's a question that said that if uh, people didn't pay attention to the task, there would be no one hertz oscillation. And in the end of the John's talk, uh, he proposed that uh, for explicit implicit learning, there is a conversion between explicit that will convert it to an implicit, and there you will learn. So I want to ask John, is, do you have any opinion on the second level what, or even third level how, uh, this conversion between explicit and implicit happening, and how can attention or this explicit understanding help the learning? Yeah, I mean, I've worried about that a lot, and I think that maybe the word conversion is, is bad because it suggests that maybe you are taking one thing and transmuting it into another. Um, whereas you could imagine some kind of, um, and this is completely conjectural, it's sort of internal thing where you do have a model-based explicit representation, right? And then that turns into a kind of input to another area that does statistical learning, for example, on it, right? In other words, it's not so much that this turns into that, but it forms the basis of an input to another system that it learns in a completely different way. So I'm beginning to suspect that it's not like you lose the... Although, you know, it's interesting. I don't know my ATM number. Now that they've switched to four numbers, I'm better. But whenever I traveled and the ATM pad was different, I'd have to go online, look up an ATM pad in the U.S., remember my, and, and, and do my finger thing, and then get the number from that, and then do it. 
So I say that just because at that point it looks like the explicit knowledge that I once had of my ATM number is now gone, or not, re not gone, it's not retrievable. And now I've got this other thing that takes its place, but I can retrieve the explicit number with a clue. So my guess is you, one trains the other, but they're separate, and one doesn't actually convert into the other, is my suspicion now. Thank the speaker, the answer.